All right, welcome back. This is CS50, and this is the end of week nine. So, just a couple of FYIs. This Friday, we'll resume the tradition of lunch. If you are available, 1 15 p.m., go to cs50.net slash RSVP. This week, we'll be joined by、uh, Eugene Chung of NEA, a VC firm, as well as by Andrew McCollum, one of the co founders of Facebook. So, if you'd like to eat, as well as strike up chats with these kind folks and CS50 staff, do RSVP.、Um, seminars, too. So, besides having Having these videos and these upcoming in person seminars, know that. Um, in addition to the Blackberries that RIM has kindly made available for a small number of us to do final projects with, Microsoft has also now contributed the same, a few Windows phones. So we will post later today on the course's homepage a link via which you can register an interest in doing, if you would like, a mobile project, and we will see if we can equip you with some hardware.、Uh, so the rumors are true.、Uh, a certain someone will be coming to campus on Monday.、Um, so as to his name. It's Mark Zuckerberg.、Uh, <laughs> he's with a, a company called The Facebook.、Uh, this is a social networking site. If you're on MySpace, go to facebook.com to try out this one.、Um, in case there's been a misinformation, realize that the panel session, which will be on Friday,、uh, Monday evening,、um, is open to all undergraduates, but space is going to be limited to only about 200 people. And so OCS、um, has a URL that you can visit if you would like to apply by submitting your resume, as well as a question for Mark.、Um, and then they and Facebook will decide exactly how the ticketing is done. So, I really don't want to see 614 disappointed faces during CS50 on Monday. Mark will be at MIT during CS50 on Monday, not here.、Um, so you can keep doing your thing. And if you're watching this、uh, right now in your dorm room, well, you can keep doing the same on Monday as well.、Um, but in the evening will be this special event. And you can go to this URL and type in that keyword to actually apply、uh, for this event. So, should be fun. All right, so imagine my surprise when, in reviewing the week's videos and looking at our curriculum, I came across this little nugget of our section.、Um, you may know the character in this video. We film one of our sections each week for our distant students and our sleepier students, and this here、uh, is what we saw on Halloween Monday. So you might be asking yourself, what's with the giant pumpkin? Well, of course. Tonight is Halloween.、Um, so this year, I decided to wear a giant pumpkin again to、um, overcome my self consciousness in this costume. <laughs> so. <laughs> So he goes on and tells like, this really sad two minute story about he how he showed up to a Halloween party when he was like 10 years old, dressed as a pumpkin, and the only one dressed up at this party as anything.、Um, so it's a very sweet tale.、Um, but, and then、um, <laughs> the funny thing was just fast forwarding through random points of Monday's section and just seeing pumpkin, pumpkin, like teaching about、uh, the, the post submissions and teaching about web pages. It's actually kind of surreal.、Um, but let me play at least the end of this clip so Jason gets closure. So. We hope it stays inflated for the full 90 minutes and that it doesn't affect the audio too much、um, and that it doesn't distract you. More importantly, that it doesn't distract you from the material.、Uh, but if it does, I can't do anything about it because I'm not wearing anything under here. So we'll just have to go with it. <laughs> so this is CS50. <laughs> so.、Um, Without further ado, today's goal is to equip us with some more of the fundamental concepts with which you can start implementing more and more dynamic websites. We are well beyond the point of HTML and CSS now, and we've begun looking, recall, at PHP, this actual programming language, as well as briefly on Monday, this、uh, database language called SQL. So realize that conceptually, we've been throwing a lot at you all at once, and they're all related, but they are all nonetheless autonomous languages and autonomous、uh, techniques. Technologies that just happen to be commingled a whole lot together. And so, MySQL. Recall is a very popular database with which you, in which you can store data in table form, in row form, and the like. Problem set seven, you'll find, or are finding, hopefully, really walks you through the process of using some database tables and the like. And you'll find that it's a very good stepping stone for any web based final project. But there's even more that we can do. So let me turn us back to our copy of some of the Frosh IM's code from the other day. I'm going to go ahead here and open up Gedit. I'm going to go ahead and open up Frosh IM's five. Which was one of the last ones we looked at. And recall that this had at least one nice feature whereby 
in addition to checking, did the user give me their name and their gender and their dorm? Also, later on, if they didn't, I was at least kind enough to not only yell at them with big red text, if there's an error, go ahead and display this div tag in red color. While we also, later on, recall, added this little tidbit over on the right hand side. These form elements can have value attributes that can themselves have some string inside of quotes. And so here we had post、uh, bracket quote unquote name, so that at least if I got my name right, I don't need to. Redo this. And this might seem like such a simple thing, but just imagine or take notice in weeks to come just how many websites don't do these very simple user conveniences. A very underappreciated feature of、uh, programming and web development is user interface design. And frankly, one of the reasons that so many of us are enamored with things like Android phones and iPhones and the like is because some companies do actually get this.、Um, and so, Keep these sorts of things in mind as you design your own projects. But HTML special chars, long though a function name it is, actually does have some compelling use. Why did we wrap post bracket name with this function call, HTML special chars? What did it do for us? Anyone at all? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, it's to ensure that users can't inject arbitrary code. In this case, they can't type like some HTML tags or, as we'll soon see, some JavaScript code that might then accidentally get executed on the browser. And now, recall the simple example I did by outputting like a bold tag, open bracket B, close bracket, was kind of stupid in that the only one I'm really messing with in that, on Monday's example was myself, right? All I do, it, it did is make the web page look bad and broken to myself. But recall these things called phishing attacks and the spams we all get daily where there's links linking to Websites and recall too that forms can be submitted both by post as well as by get. And if you submit a form via get, that just means every piece of information is inside of the URL. So if you can store form submissions inside of a URL and you can put URLs in emails like spam, well, you can trick people effectively into submitting forms. And one of the things you'll be able to compromise potentially if you don't distrust all user input in this fashion is people's cookies can be stolen. More on those today. And what does this really mean? It means if you're logged into something sensitive like your Facebook account or your bank account or the like, potentially some bad guy. Who's duped you into clicking some phishing email can log into your account and then do whatever he or she wants with your own access. So, this is good practice and necessary practice these days. But this form was not all that user friendly. If I go ahead and open up Firefox and I go to localhost slash tilde j harvard for oshims5, we see this form here and I can start to register. And let me give at least a dorm and click register. But it was only a partial improvement in terms of UI, user interface. Notice I did not pre populate dorm this time, and that's kind of annoying, right? How do we actually do this? Well, unfortunately, we have to do it in a slightly different way because the dorm、uh, field, recall, was implemented not with an input tag, but with something called a select tag. So let me zoom in on the HTML. For dorm here, and notice that drop down menus are a little different. Open bracket select, you give the parameter a name, and then you have a whole bunch of options and values down, 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 down the list. And there's a dichotomy here, recall. There's the value of the option, and then also what the human sees. For simplicity, I did exactly the same thing. I put value equal to what the user sees, but you could have something different. If you wanted more descriptive text, or in quotes, maybe even less descriptive text. But notice that there's no mention of selection here, there's no mention of value. So, of course, when I reload, Load this page or spit out the HTML again, it's going to forget that Matthews was selected. Somehow, what we need to do here is if I scroll down to Matthews, I need to somehow output something like this not just option value equals Matthews, but option selected equals selected value equals Matthews. Now, if you're thinking this looks stupid, this does look stupid. The fact that you have to say selected equals quote unquote selected, this is sort of a remnant from the early days of HTML where in the beginning you didn't need to have. Values associated with attributes. You could just have single keywords like this. And indeed, if you Google around and read HTML references, you might still see people doing things like this. But the folks decided. A few years ago, that we need to at least start standardizing the syntax. And for any of those anomalies where they were just single keywords, it's going to be the same keyword equals quote unquote itself. So that is just the way things are, for better or for worse. But this is an uninteresting detail intellectually, but programmatically now, how do we generate that string among all of these options 
selectively. In other words, as I'm spitting out or generating in my PHP code this drop down menu, I need to pause with some kind of if condition or branch and say, wait a minute, if this is what the user selected, I need to reselect this for him or her by spitting out precisely that HTML. So let's take a look. At version 6, then, here, Frosh IMs. So notice at the very top, we have a bunch of comments as before, but I've introduced a new feature that you might have seen already in PSET 7, that of arrays that can be declared using literally a function. Called array. So, frankly, this is kind of a nasty piece of syntax in PHP that you can't just declare an array with square brackets or some other syntax as we even could in C, but instead you have to literally call a function called array. But again, this is simply the way it is. So, dollar sign dorms, I've capitalized just to convey the idea here that this is a, an, an, a global array that I'm going to be using everywhere, but it's just a variable storing this array of elements. So, PHP supports normal arrays, Z, bracket 0, bracket 1, bracket 2. So this is not an associative array. This is just an array. And I've hit enter on every line just to keep it more readable. So notice at the end, I have close paren, semicolon to end the function call. So stored in this moment in time, then, in this variable is that whole array. So, this is all copy paste from earlier. I'm just making sure the user has actually submitted all of the fields I care about. So, let's see now how I'm generating the HTML. Well, if I scroll down here, notice that captain and gender are actually the same, but look how much more elegant now the dorm generation is. So, I have a new construct that we predicted would come、uh, a couple days ago, which is the for each construct. I have this inside of open bracket question mark, which says to the web server, here's some PHP code, don't spit this out. Interpret it instead. The syntax for this loop is for each variable name as other variable name. So the array comes first and then a temporary variable. We could call this anything we want, but you might as well choose something that's a little more friendly. And then notice the colon here. And this is important because the moment you close PHP mode here, stuff's just going to start getting spit out raw. So you need to just be clear to PHP that what follows is actually inside of conceptually this loop. Just, and then notice the opposite of this is the somewhat verbosely named end for each with no space. So, alternatively, you could do something C style. You could actually say, well, open curly brace and then close curly brace here. So, this would actually be fine as well. It just、mm, looks a little uglier, perhaps. But either style is fine so long as you are consistent. Then, what are we doing here? Well, notice this is not inside of PHP mode. So, that means if we're inside of this loop, this stuff's just going to get spit out, literally. So, open bracket, option, value equals quote. And then we get back into PHP mode. And then we exit PHP mode, close quote, close bracket, open PHP mode. And we spit out dorm again. Recall the redundancy of the way I structure this. End PHP mode, and then raw HTML again. But I'm not doing something here. I'm kind of skipping a step I thought I just in,、uh, insisted was important, which is I'm not escaping dorm here. Why not? Yeah. Oh, sure. Oh, OK. What's that? Yeah, that's it. It's as simple as that, right? If I am the one who created this list of elements, I don't really need to call a function and incur the slight computational cost of actually executing a function just to escape a string that I myself wrote. Now, if you really wanted to be paranoid and not even trust yourself or the person you're working with, you could certainly do this. But realize the distinction here is as simple as well, this array was for me. Not from the user. So now we have the ability to dynamically generate this list. We're not doing any kind of ifs or elfs yes, yet to actually see which the user has already submitted. So the end result is actually going to be pretty similar. If I go to froshim6.php in my browser, we, damn it,、uh, that's the mistake David forgot to fix since Monday. So we're going to cheat and copy this, put this over here. And how about by next week? We'll fix that problem. Just like the Wi Fi question I keep forgetting to ask. So let's go. <laughs> That was not intended to be a running gag. All right, so here we go. Oh, and now I messed up my formatting. So that's all right. So here we go. Simulate correctness. <laughs> so <laughs> right, do as I say, not as I do. All right, so now I can go ahead and type David and I can click register. And I'm actually still going to get yelled at here, but the menu is still the same. It's not pre populated yet, but if I actually look at the page source by right clicking or control clicking, I at least see the HTML that I saw before. Now there's a little more white space this time and some weird indentation. And again, this is not a big deal. Your output does not need to be pretty printed, but your actual PHP code and HTML you write should be. But this is now machine generated. And in fact, if you start looking at the source code of most websites, you'll see patterns. 
like this, where it's all indented identically. And that's not because a human necessarily did that. It's because there's some programming code, some PHP or whatnot, that's spitting this out in some kind of loop. So I need to be able to ask myself the question if what I'm about to spit out in this drop down menu is equal to what the user typed in or selected, I need to reselect it for him or her. So let's go ahead and open up Frosh IM 7. Now, and we see the same array of dorms up top. We see the same error checking code at top. And if I scroll down now, notice that I've done something slightly different and realize there's a bunch of different ways to do this. And you'll see different ways in section and in online tutorials. But here, notice that just to keep things prettier, I've only entered PHP mode once at the very top, and then I'm closing it down here. Just because, frankly, if you start going in and out and in and out of PHP mode, it just gets hard to read. So I decided to write this all in one big for loop. So we have the same looping structure for each dorms as dorm. And then, frankly, this is week one stuff again. It's a different language, but same idea. If what the user submitted, which recall is stored inside of a special super global variable called dollar sign underscore post, equals equals the value of the current dorm as we are looping through all of them, we'll then go ahead and spit out literally option selected equals quote unquote selected, value equals quote unquote dorm, then dorm, then close option, close quote. Uh, semicolon. And now notice this. this. This is C stuff also. If I've got double quotes on the outside, I have to have single quotes on the inside. Or what else could I do to avoid confusing the interpreter by having weird quotes in the middle of quotes? You could escape it, right? Almost, when in doubt, you can do something like backslash quote, and that would also get the job done as well. Frankly, it's just a little harder to read, so you might as well toggle in and out of single quotes. Else, if the user did not type in the current element, just go ahead and spit this out instead. So, again, week one stuff sort of updated for PHP. So, let's now go back to the browser. This is version 7. Let me go ahead and open up froshim7.php. And let me go ahead and learn from my past mistakes. Uh, let's go back to six. All right. Uh huh. All right. All right. And reload. Problem solved. David was from Matthews. I'm going to skip gender and captain. Register. I'm yelled at, but notice what did not break this time. Now Matthews is pre selected, and if I go into my source code, view page source, scroll down here, voila, it's not being formatted as nicely now because I'm not printing out white space, but that's fine too. In fact, we're saving some bytes this way. But if I scroll right, 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 right to Matthews, notice that Matthews does look a little different. And that's it. So, again, we're really using PHP now to dynamically generate HTML to structure and stylize our page as we see fit. Any questions? Anything at all? All right.、Uh, yeah. Oh, what, did I explain what echo meant? No. So, sorry, I took for granted what echo meant. And it really means、um, kind of what the word suggests echo this literally. So, it's actually synonymous with saying print.、Um, however, echo is just a built in option in PHP. So, I could either say print and print this out. And let me scroll back to the left. Or you can say echo.、Um, they're pretty much equivalent. And in fact, you don't actually need the parenthesis for the echo call, which is perhaps useful for some folks. So, good question there. Other questions? Yeah. Ah, good question. Where did I introduce the lowercase dorm variable? It was implicitly declared inside of the for each construct itself. So the moment I mention it after the keyword as, it, becomes, it comes into existence and it automatically gets updated on every iteration of the loop. All right, so recall that where we left off on Monday was with this slightly more exciting example in that we generated emails automatically for Frosh IMs 8. And if we scroll down here, notice that we see the same HTML because this form submits to register 8. And recall that, oh, this, sorry, this was not the email example. This was instead the database example. So recall what we actually did with the data here. So let's focus now on the top, which was just some error checking. And below that was the database connection. So there's a couple of things going on here. We mentioned when we first started talking about the internet that a single server can certainly do multiple things these days. It can be a web server, email server, instant messaging server. And so when a packet of data arrives at some server on the internet, how does the server know if it is an email or web page request or instant message? What was the underlying technology that answered questions of that form? Yeah. 
Yeah, so it was a port number, right? We talked briefly and we had this fun video talking about, about IP and TCP. And TCP was simply the protocol that says, one, if data gets dropped somewhere along the way, TCP is responsible for resending it. But TCP was also responsible for assigning a number to most services on the internet. Like web is 80 by convention, and also 443, which is the SSL or HTTPS version. More on that today.、Um, uh, 25 is email, 22 is something called SSH, 21 is something called FTP and the like. So upon receiving some packet and seeing, OK, a y this is for my IP address and it's for port 80, the web server knows that this is indeed for him. But in this case, there's another something running on the server. In this case, the appliance, but it could be an actual server on the internet. And that's something called a MySQL server, a database server whose purpose in life is to listen for connections, listen for requests for databases, and then listen for things like insert and delete and select and the like. So if we look here, At these first two lines, the first line is literally doing that, having my PHP code open in connection, a network connection to the local host using username jharvard and password crimson. In theory, the server could be elsewhere on the internet, but because MySQL traffic is not encrypted by default, it's not a good idea to try to connect to a database server elsewhere on the internet from your own web server. So they're usually in the same company, in the same building or the like, or literally on the same machine, as is the case here. So, What we next do is we select a very specific database. This is like opening a specific Excel file on your desktop, even though you might have multiple ones. And then we have to get into this habit of avoiding. Dangerous input, scrubbing input, or error checking, really. So notice I'm calling this a very long named function, which really does something as simple as anytime it sees like a quote mark, it makes it backslash quote mark, and a couple of other things. Very simple things so that you're not accidentally tricked into executing a delete statement or an update statement or something potentially dangerous. I don't have to bother scrubbing the captain input because remember, captain is a checkbox, and so its value is going to be nothing. At all, or it's going to be quote unquote on. So I'm not even passing the user's input literally. I'm just checking implicitly if the captain field has something in it, go ahead and set captain to one, else set captain to zero. And then I'm just going to literally insert my own one or zero. Gender, I do want to scrub because the user is submitting either M or F, and I don't want them potentially to submit something other than those. And then here too, With MySQL real escape string, I'm making sure that the dorm the user has submitted is also legitimate. Now, why is this even a concern? If we go to the web page, right, the only values I can choose from are those here in the drop down. But we saw very simple examples of this the other day. If I right click or control click on this,、uh, recall that there's this inspect element option thanks to a free plugin called Firebug. This lets me do a bunch of things. For one thing, it, remember,、uh, cleans up your HTML, makes it nicely indented, and you can、uh, expand and collapse it. Which just makes it user friendly to navigate and poke around. But you can literally change things in the web page, not permanently, but on my own computer. So I could actually change Matthews to be something like University Hall, is where I live, and we'll change this to be. Uh, University Hall, and then I go back here, and voila, I've changed the form. So now all I have to do is click Submit, and even though the web server did not design for University Hall to be in this list, what's going to get submitted is University Hall. Now, this is kind of innocuous and silly, but what if I instead did something in my HTML like, well, not University Hall, but maybe something like a quote mark, and then delete from users,、uh, enter. Oh, now the quote mark. Let's get rid of the quote mark because I just broke my own HTML attack. So let's just, write, let's just simulate it with delete. Okay? So this is an oversimplification. It's not sufficient just to send delete to the server, but it's this easy to actually change the web page. And frankly, real hackers don't go using these free GUI tools and changing the HTML. You would actually write a program, a little PHP script, like we did on Monday、um, for, just, uh, for doing spell checking in PHP, and you can simulate. Being a web browser. In fact, recall that from one of the, the survey from problem set five, where we asked you guys to gripe about things、uh, that were, could be better on campus, one of the top contenders was this website here. Right, let's go back to a different browser here.、Uh, let's use Chrome. Was this guy here. Um, it seems not, to, they have a whole lot of information on this site when really all of us apparently only care about like, what's in the menu. And even getting there sometimes takes multiple clicks.、Um, but there's a lot of news going on at HUDs right now.、Um, but in any case, we have, oh yeah, here we go, case in point, this week's menu. 
Hot entrees. OK. So here is the menu. And unfortunately, this is hosted, I think, by some third party product that maybe Harvard has paid for. This is all HTML. And this menu changes every day because presumably HUDs has their own database. And so we could, frankly, as humans, just say, all right, well, I'm going to highlight and copy this. I'm going to paste this into my own database. Highlight and copy turkey noodle soup, paste this into my own database or your Excel spreadsheet. And frankly, if you've ever done a research project or even something for a student group, there's probably some very tedious process you've done at some point involving. The web that could have ideally been automated. And so, what we actually do for CS50 is if you go to、uh, manual.cs50.net. Slash APIs for application programming, interfaces,、uh, application programming interfaces, you'll see that CS50 has a whole bunch of APIs. An API we'll talk more about next week, but again, it's a way of interfacing your code and your programs with someone else's code or someone else's data. And so every year we get very common requests for how can I make something related to the course catalog or events on campus or food or maps or news or twe-、uh, tweets and the like. So, what we as a course have done is created an API via Which you can query CS50 server and get information like what's on the dining hall menu today, or tomorrow, or next week, or what was it a year ago today? What's the nutritional content? And so if you go to the HUD's food,、uh, the Harvard Food API from CS50, And scroll down, you'll see that there's a lot of detail on how to do this. But if you're familiar with Excel files, you might also be familiar with CSV files, comma, separated var-、uh, values files. These are just sort of simple spreadsheets. And so, what you can do by visiting a certain URL that's there on the top right is you can provide a specific date.、Uh, so, in this case here, let me scroll down to the menu, not the nutritional one. So, notice here. That we have told folks that if you want to get the、uh, men- breakfast menu for a date of March 21st, 2011, you can literally visit this URL on CS50 server, food.cs50.net, and what you will get back effectively is a big CSV file, an Excel spreadsheet. And this is just what we're doing for problem set seven when we grab data from. Uh, Yahoo Finance. You're getting data back like this. But unfortunately,、um, HUDs does not provide, like Yahoo does, a little download link. And so, what we as a course had to do was well, we opened up this page and we looked at view page source and we ignored all the distractions up at top and we started looking for patterns. And once we found a pattern like this, feels like patterns. Let's actually use Control F. So, let's look for Chipotle corn bisque. Control F. All right, there it is. So here is the HTML in HUDS's website. And notice that it's in a whole bunch of tags, some of which we've seen, some of which we haven't. There's some div tags, some image tags, and the like. But my God, like, this is how the data is actually presented on the internet. So, long story short, what we did as a course is we wrote something called a screen scraper. This is frankly a tool of last resort, but we have a program running on cs50.net that every day pretends to be a browser, like Firefox, goes to HUD's website, downloads the HTML, and it throws away the images and uninteresting stuff like that. And then we quote unquote parse all of this HTML. We look for TD tags, input tags, div tags, and then we look for patterns like, oh, this. Looks like a piece of food. And then we associate that back with the date and the meal and so forth. And long story short, we scrape all of this data into our own database so that we can re expose this.、Um, now, why? What's the relevance then to what we just did with the simple form submission? Well, it's very, very easy to pretend to be a browser. All you have to do is understand HTTP, understand HTML, and you can simulate all of this. And in fact, for final projects every year, we always have folks who want to grab like, sports scores from ESPN.com or the like. So realize that in manual.cs50.net, there's a long article on how you can write your own screen scraper to get most any data you want from the internet in order to do analyses. People have done this with Facebook friendships and so forth to do research projects. Projects and the like,、um, but、uh, realize that it is now within your grasp. So, we've scrubbed our inputs, both for name, captain, gender, dorm. Now we have to construct a SQL query. So, this query here is of this form insert into table name, and then a comma separated list of fields that we want to insert into, then values, and then another comma separated list of the actual values we want to insert, and then that's it. My SQL query passing in that SQL code, and voila, it's now in our database. So, who cares? What, what do we actually do when it's in our database? Well, think about what we could now do. We could whip up a little script for a proctor, and we could say something like this. And I'll just do a cursory form of this.、Uh, let me go ahead and do registrants. Oh, oops. Let's do open PHP mode, close PHP mode,、uh, registrants. Actually, let's just open this one. Whoops, not that. 
let's just open this one, and voila, it's already out of the oven. The program now will look a little something like this. So connect to database. Same exact thing up top. We connect with localhost jharvard and crimson to that specific database called week 9. Notice then my SQL query. I just create a variable called dollar sign SQL. I store in it what's apparently another SQL query, and this one follows the form select field names. So I could do name,、uh, captain, Uh, dorm, gender, in any order, or a little more succinctly, I can just say star, which is the wildcard operator, from the table name. I could write this in lowercase here, but it's as a matter of style, it's, I would say, easier to read when at least your special keywords are all in uppercase. However, realize this FAQ, table names and field names should be case sensitive. So if you capitalized it in your database, do it that way in your code, and then execute this query. But here is a common sticking point. When you execute this database query and you use the select command, what do you actually get back? Well, inside of the database are these tables, right? Like Excel worksheets. So, what you're getting back is not some one person's、uh, name and gender and so forth. Rather, you're getting back what we'll call a result set. Think of this as an array of rows from the database. So, if we scroll down here and we actually want to write this page that's supposed to show the proctor who's in charge of Frosh IMs. Who has registered? Notice we actually have to ask this result set that we got back from MySQL query, which is up here give me a row, give me a row, give me a row. And we can do that with a while loop. We can say while there is a row to give me. So this function, MySQL fetch array, when passed a so called result set, a collection of all the rows in the database that match that select query, go ahead and assign one at a time to a variable called row. And then I can get at the individual fields in that table by doing dollar sign row open bracket, quote unquote name, close bracket. So, based on this syntax, what type of variable or what type of data structure is row at this point in the story?、Yeah, it's an array, but more specifically, an It's an associative array, right? It's an array that can have not just in,、uh, numeric indices, but words as its keys. And so, what's this going to do? li is list item, ul is unordered list. So, let's just jump to the、uh, aesthetic results here and go back to registrants.php. This is going to talk to that same database. Let me go into registrants, and voila, David has registered. Well, well, it's not all that interesting right now. Let's go into register, let's say, 8.php. Let's actually register Matt this time as the team captain from,、uh, I don't remember where he lived, so we'll say Apple Court. Register. OK, Matt is apparently registered. Well, let's check. Let's go back to registrants.php, and now we have Matt. And then we could have another person. And we can now see this. If I open up my little administrative tool called phpMyAdmin, and I log in as jharvard. And crimson. I then get to see this sort of web based interface for all these tables, one of which is week nine, registrants. And if I zoom in here, notice that despite all the messy words and icons, there's David, there's Matt. And if I want to go around here and even modify things, say Matt actually wants to change his name, this is not something Matt himself should do, but you as the administrator could certainly change a row, which then has the effect of changing. The actual table. So now we have the ability to store data as long as we want. And frankly, not to sort of set the expectations too high, I mean, this is at the core of what even Facebook did early on. You have someone register, you ask for their name, you ask for their residence, you ask then for them to list off their friends and so forth. You can do all of that simply by creating these tables and storing that kind of information. And anytime you have something conceptually different that you want to store, say user profiles and friends and likes and activities, you can have a different MySQL table doing. All of that. And recall from problem set seven that we don't just store users' usernames and their hashes of passwords. What other field is also, by default in PSA7, associated with each user?、Oh, what's that? So, not just money, but an ID, an ID specifically. So, here's the users table, recall, that you get for PSET 7. You have all these usernames and these hashes, which are hashes of passwords, but we also gave everyone a unique ID. And if you read through the PSET spec, you'll see that this ID is auto incrementing, which means I, in code, do not have to generate or figure out what the next number should be. The database will do that for me. So, Facebook did the same thing. Some of you who have never signed up for nicknames for your URLs might have facebook.com slash profile.php. 
question mark ID equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or some number much bigger. That's because all of us have unique、uh, Facebook IDs. And you can actually infer from those IDs who's been on Facebook the longest. The biggest, bigger your number is, the later you signed up. So there are、um, certainly folks. So I actually, this is really sad that I know this. I am number 6,545. That was apparently the number in which I signed up. Mark, I think for some reason, is ID equals 3. And then there's also some familiar names if you poke around the Facebook API where you can see everyone's IDs. But long story short, why have IDs? For users, when we already have usernames, which themselves are supposed to be unique. Caesar, Chartier, Guest, J. Harvard. Why have IDs at all? It's much easier to index ints than. What do you mean, index ints? Perfect, right? So it actually is for performance reasons. Caesar is kind of, it's a short word, but it's one, two, three, four, five, six characters.、Um, J. Harvard is slightly more.、Uh, R. Bowden is a few characters as well. That's a bunch of bytes. And certainly for longer usernames, like some of you have for your at college.harvard.edu accounts, you know, that suggests that you have to do string comparisons a lot. Stir comp, if you think back to the C function. It feels like it should be much faster if you instead give everyone a unique number, like an integer, then you're using only. Four bytes or 32 bits, and plus you can then sort things numerically. You can create, as we've seen in class, more sophisticated data structures like linked lists and hash tables and the like that store those numbers. And so, indeed, storing ID numbers that are ints or something called big ints, which are 64 bit integers, tends to be the best way of storing your data so that then, if you want to list for, say,、uh, Caesar, all of his friends, you can have another table. And let's whip something up here. I'm going to go ahead and create a new table for PSET 7, which is irrelevant to PSET 7, but we'll use the same users called friends. I'm going to give this two columns, enter. And the first column, I'm going to, be,、uh, I'm going to say、uh, user A. And over here, I'm going to say user B. And if I give these guys both integer types, the idea here is that if I want to associate users with other users to form symmetrics, whether symmetric or asymmetric, all I have to do is say that Caesar, for instance, is friends with、uh, who was number two?、Uh, well, whoever number two was. So if I want to say that Caesar and Matt are friends, all I have to do is store in this table one and two. And as you'll see before long, there are ways to then join these tables. So long as you have one field in common, like an ID field, you can actually figure out or look up users in one table whose IDs are already in another. And in fact, even CS50's own course shopping tool, we have this notion of what your friends are taking or shopping in the way of courses. This is literally what we do. When you sign in to Harvard courses using your Facebook, Facebook login, one of the things Facebook gives us because we're using their API is a huge array of all of the IDs of all of your friends. And we can then use those IDs to look up your friends' names and profile pictures and their courses as well. So, if nothing else, if you're just curious as to what Facebook actually makes available to people, you can play around with their tutorials online. And see just how much information is being shared, and frankly, how, many,、um, how much data even we have on you just because you've logged into your Facebook account. So, that little warning that either freaks you out or you completely ignore and just click OK these days, I mean, it's actually your consent to giving websites a whole bunch of data about you in machine readable format,、um, as we'll see quite soon. Any questions? Feels like a tough crowd today. Why don't we take our five minute break here? All right. Oh, it feels like we definitely have a dead feel today. So I'll try to tell a scary story toward the end that、um, affects your pr-、uh, privacy and security. All right.、Um, <laughs> all right. So, and don't wake that person up in the green there today. <laughs> tell her I say hi. All right. So,、um, <laughs> okay. So, we promise that there's this feature to store data. In the server, even after a user has gone from one web page to another and that icon has stopped spinning.、Right? We mentioned on Monday that HTTP is stateless, which just means that you don't maintain a persistent connection to the server usually. Rather, you、um, have to click on a link or submit a form to actually go from page to page. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Facebook itself right now actually uses a lot of something called AJAX, which means a lot of JavaScript code is constantly querying the server saying, Do I have a, a, an instant message? Do I have an instant Message, do I have a status update or the like? So, not all websites do this, but most websites do actually not maintain、uh, state unless you do it 
do not maintain a persistent connection to the server. But suppose we want to do that. Let me go ahead and open up a file called、uh, counter.php and gedit. And this is a very short program among this week's code. That looks like this. At the very top, I've got some comments, and then I've got this new function that you may have seen in problem set seven, but just taken for granted called session start. Session start is simply a function that PHP uses to tell the web server, give me access to a special global variable called. Dollar sign underscore session. This is another associative array inside of which you can put anything. For instance, the contents of someone's shopping cart, their user ID to remember that they've logged in, any data that you want to persist from page load to page load. And frankly, any website that has users logging in these days uses sessions so that again, the icon can stop spinning and the connection can close so that this is partially for scalability's sake. If you go to Amazon.com, it might take a second or two to download the whole web page, but you, the human, might spend Five seconds, a minute on that web page, and it would just be a waste of resources to have your browser constantly connected to the web server for all of that minute. So instead, the browser disconnects, you see the content, and then you can click something or submit something to actually get more content. So session start ensures that even if this user disconnects, and frankly, even if this user closes their laptop lid, walks across campus, then goes back to their dorm and opens the laptop lid, then it's going to still remember who you are and that you're. Logged in, right? It's relatively rare that you need to re log into Facebook and other sites because they're remembering that you're logged in, especially if you click that little checkbox that most sites have. So, this line of code just means give me access to dollar sign underscore session. So, what am I doing next? Well, we've seen the isSet function before. It just says, is this variable set? Does it have a value? And I'm going to say, if isSet, dollar sign underscore session, quote unquote counter. So, if this variable's been set, what do I want to do? I want to grab its value, and for reasons we'll see in a moment, I want to store it in a variable called dollar sign counter, all lowercase. Else, if this variable is not set in the session, that is, we've never seen this user before, go ahead and initialize this counter variable to zero. Now, down here, we have dollar sign session, quote unquote, counter gets counter plus one. So this is a counter in the literal sense. We're doing plus one, plus one, plus one every time this code is executed, that is, every time this page. Is loaded. What does the page do? It's actually very simple. You have visited this site some number of times. And I'm kind of re regressing back to week two or three where I cut grammatical corners, but so be it. The point here is that I'm outputting the counter value. So let's open this up. Let me go ahead and open up Firefox. Let me go back to localhost in John Harvard's account and then open up counter. And OK, I visited the site zero times. Let me zoom in. Let me go ahead and hit reload or control R one time. Two times, three times. And this will very quickly get boring, but notice at the very top of Firefox, it is connecting to the server and then disconnecting, so it's apparently remembering somehow. That I've been here before. Now, this is a simple example, but in real websites like Facebook and the like, it just remembers that you've logged in. That user 6,545 is logged in so that they don't have to pester me on every page, give me your password, give me your password. Or in the case of Amazon, so that they don't forget as you go from page to page what's already in your shopping cart. So you could put product IDs, not user IDs, in a shopping cart as well. So let's see this, how this actually works. Let me go ahead and open up. Uh, let me first go ahead and clear my cache. And so, this too should be a good habit to get into when doing anything web related, when writing software, to clear your browser's cache constantly, just so that if you already changed some code on the server, but the browser didn't realize for efficiency reasons, this way you're telling it to re download the code. So, I'm going to go ahead and clear now. I'm going to go ahead and open up Firefox anew. And I'm going to visit this URL, but before I hit enter, I'm going to click this guy up here. So, pre installed in the appliance is that Firebug tool. If I click this, it's going to open here at the bottom. And what I'm going to do is scroll not to the HTML part this time, but to this tab, the Net tab. So, by default, it's off for performance. I'm going to click Enable the Net tab. And now I just get another tab whose purpose in life is going to be to sniff all of my HTTP traffic, very similar to what that live HTTP headers plugin did a while ago for us. So, here we go. I'm going to go ahead and hit Enter. And voila, apparently I've only visited one web page. It's called counter.php. It used HTTP GET, so there was no POST involved. It was on this server called localhost. The file that came back was 140 bytes. The IP address that it's on is apparently 127.0.0.1. That is the numeric synonym for quote unquote localhost. And port 80 means 
the web server. That's all. So we're seeing all these fundamentals here. So let me go ahead and expand this thing, and we'll see exactly what was sent from client to server. So let me scroll down here the request headers. So in addition to sending that get request, It included my browser all this information the name of the server it's contacting, the user agent, which is the browser. So, this cryptic string uniquely identifies this version of Firefox on this version of Fedora Linux. Then there's some slightly uninteresting stuff about what the browser supports.、Um, and it also mentions here oh, I accept gzip. So, one way. That web browsers and servers save time is they compress information, HTML, on the fly automatically. So, this is the browser's way of saying, hey, I can support compression if you want to compress the responses you're going to send me. So, what did the server send back? Well, here are the server's headers. The server announces the date and time in Greenwich Mean Time here.、Uh, this mentions it's what server software we're running. It mentions the version of the server software we're running,、um, which is actually a potential security hole, but in the appliance, we leave everything on for debugging purposes. This is Is also a potential security concern. The server is also very freely saying, by the way, I have PHP installed. Moreover, I have PHP 5.3.8 installed. Why is this probably not the best practice for a server in general to do this, security wise? Yeah. So, it's saying you could inject code potentially. So, one, you're obviously revealing that you're running PHP as opposed to other languages. And it's not always obvious from the URL.、Um, two, suppose that there's some bug d- d-、uh, discovered in PHP's interpreter. And so, some big announcement goes out on the internet on various email security lists and says, hey, everyone beware, PHP 5.3.8 is buggy. You, there's this security hole in it. Here's how people can take advantage of it. So, be sure to update. Well, the whole world is not going to update instantaneously. So, all the bad Guys have to do now is troll around on the internet looking for IP addresses of web servers that say, hey, I'm running that buggy version of PHP. Here is you know, my proclamation thereof. So, this bad practice in production servers, but for development purposes on an appliance, it's OK in this case. But here's the magic. Set cookie. So, you might generally know that cookies are some kinds of files or information planted by web servers on your browser. How is that done? Literally as simple as this. When you request any web page from a server, A response comes back that includes all of this juicy information date and time, server name, and so forth, but also potentially an HTTP header that literally says set cookie, and then it gives the cookie a name. And a value, and then potentially some other details. So, what's really happened here is that PHP, thanks to the session start function, has automatically sent a cookie to my server, to my browser, called PHP sesh ID, which is just the convention, and then a big crazy value of this. And this is essentially a pseudo random string that's ideally supposed to be unique, associated and given only to me. So, henceforth, The connection closes, and there is no spinning icon or anything. I visited the website zero times, but notice if I reload this page now, and let me collapse this back to just one line. If I reload this page, it does indeed say at top left, I've now visited one time, but let's now look at this request. In this request, in the request header, Notice what my browser has perhaps presumptuously sent to the server. It's sending not a set cookie header, just a cookie header. And so my browser is saying, hey, by the way, the last time I visited you, you gave me a cookie called PHP sesh ID, and here is. The value that it was equal to. So you can think of this as a hand stamp at like an amusement park or a club where they stamp your hand to indicate that you've paid or that you're 21 plus. And if you're ever asked this question again, you don't have to take out your ID or your ticket, you instead just show your hand stamp. And this is really what's going on with cookies. You're saying, I've been here before, I've been here before. And what's stamped on your hand is this really big number because what the web server then does is it stores in its own database that big number and associates with that big number. The contents of dollar sign underscore session. So, that big associative array in which you can put user IDs, friendship IDs,、uh, shopping cart contents, it's stored somehow on the server and it's associated with that big number so that the browser and server in the future assume that anyone who presents this number must be the guy that I gave this number to in the first place. And so, voila, let me let you pass. So, Works really nicely, right? And it doesn't require that you maintain a p- constant connection to the server. It doesn't require that you physically remain in the amusement park or club. You can get back in just by showing this hand stamp. So, where is the opportunity for bad guys now? How do you exploit this very useful HTTP feature? 
what can you do? So getting the cookie, right? So this cookie is being sent back and forth from server to client, but it's being sent over HTTP, specifically over port 80. And 80 is generally not encrypted, right? 443 or URLs that start with HTTPS are encrypted. So what this literally means is that if my browser is requesting this web page and then getting a response, and the server is not in the appliance on the same physical computer, but it's a normal server on the internet, facebook.com, amazon.com, what this means is that that server is replying and saying, here is your CPU. Big secret number. Send this back to us every time you revisit. But if you're using HTTP, you're literally showing your hand to everyone on the internet saying, here's my big secret number, right? It's not really a secret. Now, there are solutions to this, namely HTTPS, which means if you, just, if you know just casually as users, it encrypts everything. And that also encrypts your hand stamp and all of these cookies that are involved. But most, there are many, dare say most websites do not encrypt traffic by default. In fact, only up until a few months ago, And、only a few months ago did Facebook itself start offering across the board this ability to use HTTPS for all of your connections. And so, as I think I mentioned a week or two ago, it was perfect timing. In week、uh, eight of CS50 in fall 2010, this researcher released a tool, a plugin for Firefox called Fire、uh, Sheep. And this tool simply automated the process of looking around a room with Wi Fi capabilities and saying, who is showing their hand stamp at this point in time? And the fellow special cased websites, popular ones like Facebook and Gmail and Twitter and a bunch of others. And so he was looking for patterns like gmail.com, facebook.com. And anytime he saw in the room someone with a hand stamp for or from that domain name, he would then、uh, listen to it and store it in the program's memory and then display it. To the user. And so, what you see when using a tool like this is a little something like this.、Um, so, here is a screenshot. Things have gotten a little more locked down now, both in terms of Wi Fi and also in terms of、um, this tool working. But what you would see is you load up Firefox, and we actually did this in class if you want to watch last year's video. You click the Start Capturing button,、uh, and then what you see within a few seconds are all of the unsuspecting people who are logged into these various websites. So these are actual screenshots from the fellow's presentation、um, where he logged into、uh, one of his buddies' accounts, but rewind about 12 months to CS50. This was great fun. We had like a list of 33 CS50 students who were using like Facebook at that moment in time, and what this tool allows you to do. Do is with a single double click, log into that person's Facebook account as them. So, how does this actually work? It's actually really simple, right? If all of the internet trusts that you'll just present this hand stamp, this cookie, to prove I've already logged in, you don't need to ask me to log in again. Well, anyone who can sniff that cookie can then present him or herself as that person, and they don't know your Facebook password or your Gmail password, but that doesn't matter because they're already into your account. So, double click that name, and what you would see in the browser is voila, Ian Gallagher. Gallagher's account, or in last year's case, one of our TF's account, at which point I could proceed and post on her wall or poke people or do anything because Facebook is not going to re authenticate me. It's going to assume, hey, you have the cookie. It must, in fact, be you. So, it seems that this wonderfully useful system that like, every website on the internet uses today is fundamentally flawed. And in fact, this is still possible. I think, unless Facebook's made it by default, you have to go into、uh, account at the top right and tinker around with the security settings and say, always use secure connections. Gmail started doing this、uh, a few months back as a result of some of the hacking incidents that they had. But most websites don't do this, partly for performance reasons, partly for naivete reasons, whereby they just, the consumers aren't demanding. This, or they're just not cognizant of this. In fact, the only websites that really tend to enforce SSL, the HTTPS type sites, all the time are now Facebook and Gmail and banks and CS50.net, since we got bitten too shortly after that presentation.、Um, so, what's the takeaway here? Well, how do you solve? This problem, right? Like, literally, we introduced this last year, albeit at the risk of teaching 500 students how to then hack into their roommates' computers that day,、um, for good purposes, right? How do you defend against this? Because it is still possible. And if you're sitting somewhere on campus, if you're sitting in Starbucks, an airport, you're even your own home with siblings, you are vulnerable to interceptions of data, especially if your Wi Fi connection is not secure. If you don't see that little padlock icon or don't have to type a password to get onto the Wi Fi network, you're particularly vulnerable. So, what can you do? Well, websites unfortunately have to do 
most of the solving for us, but at least at home,、um, back home, home, if you control your wireless network, you can at least turn on that padlock icon. It's not just for the sake of keeping random people outside your house from using your Wi Fi for free, it genuinely is a security concern. They could see not just.、Um, Not just log into your Facebook account, but see all of the traffic you're sending. right? If you haven't realized,、um, most of the instant messages you send are typically not encrypted unless you're using Gmail these days over SSL. So all of those like, EIMs you're sending friends, all of those emails you're sending friends are still going out on the internet in the clear. Even Gmail, if you send from your college.harvard.edu or personal Gmail account, even if you're using SSL, the moment you hit send, if you're emailing an outsider on the internet who's not using Gmail servers, bam, that email is out there. And anyone in theory between points A and B can see all of your traffic. So, WPA2 refers to an encryption protocol that you can use on your own home wireless network.、Um, using HTTPS、uh, is the, probably the most resilient、uh, approach to protecting your Facebook account, but that's only because they now support this. A lot of websites, again, assume or, or、uh, face the reality that turning on SSL might just be expensive computationally. And this isn't always the case, it depends on the Hardware and software you have. But in theory, if you need to not just send data, but encrypt data and then send that data, just intuitively that's going to take some CPU cycles. And even if it's just a few cycles, you only have a finite number. So that means if you need to do more work per user, well, you're going to have to have more servers to sustain the same number of users potentially. But there's also these other tools so that you're well equipped. Force TLS is a plugin for Firefox, if that's your browser of choice, that will try to force all of your connections. To SSL if the website actually supports it. Another one from the EFF is called HTTPS Everywhere, which does something quite similar as well. And so, with these mechanisms, and honestly, just a bit of savvy, you can protect yourself. But another very robust mechanism that assumes you have access to something special is that of a VPN. So, Harvard has something called a virtual private network. A lot of companies have this. You can even set one up in your home. So, henceforth, if you're ever particularly worried about doing something sensitive like checking mail or financial data in a public space, whether it's at the Harvard University SSID or if it's in Starbucks or the like, even if that wireless access point Does not offer encryption, you can connect to vpn.fas.harvard.edu. You'll get redirected to an SSL connection. You can then log in to Harvard's VPN. Your computer will then be given an IP address on Harvard's network, not on Starbucks' network or the like. And henceforth, all of your traffic will be encrypted between you and Harvard. After that, who knows where it's going to go? And frankly, after that, Harvard knows everything you're doing. So just realize when you connect to Harvard, now all of their servers have access. To your data. But if you're at least trying to prevent、uh, the sketchy guy next to you in Starbucks from looking over your shoulder virtually and sniffing your passwords and poking your friends,、um, you can at least secure yourself with any of these particular mechanisms. So I promised a sketchy, security oriented ending. Why don't we go ahead and end on that note today early? And I'll take one on one questions up here. See you next week.